This claim of Jesus wasn't etched into some secret golden tablets buried in some hill in North America. It wasn't mysteriously revealed in a cave to a man we have no way of getting back to. The death of Jesus and his resurrection was a historical event on public display. The resurrection of Jesus is a bold and bewildering claim that sits right at the heart of the Christian faith. The Bible itself says that if there is no resurrection, then Christian faith is futile, we're still in our sins, and Christians are to be pitied because we're living with a false hope. So, so much riding on the resurrection, how can we make sense of it? Well, when it comes to assessing testimonial claims of any sort, like in a court of law or something like that, we have basically three possibilities. Number one, the witnesses are just deceiving people, like lying, making it all up. Number two, the witnesses are themselves deceived, as in they're not trying to deceive people, they're just confused, misinformed. Or number three, the possibility that perhaps if they're not deceiving or deceived, they're just devoted to the truth, to telling it like it really happened. So these are basically the three possibilities that we have when it comes to considering and assessing the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection in the Bible. And using this trilemma as a sort of grid, if history tells us that Jesus died and after his death his tomb was found empty and people said he was alive again, then the first possibility that we have for explaining all of this is that Jesus' friends were deceiving people. They were just lying about it all. One theory that's been put forward to give credibility to this is known as the stolen body theory. This theory is actually first mentioned in the Bible itself, Matthew chapter 28, where some of the Jewish leaders put forward this rumor to explain why the tomb was empty, that Jesus' friends snuck in and, and stole the body while the guards were asleep and fabricated this whole elaborate resurrection myth. But as a theory, it has some serious problems. For one, it's just difficult to see how sleeping Roman guards wouldn't wake up with the noise of a moving boulder from the entrance of the tomb. And even if they did wake up, it's not likely that Jesus' followers, uh, teenage women amongst them, would have gotten the better of some heavily armed Roman soldiers. For another, even supposing that Jesus' friends did steal the body against all odds, you'd think we'd have some sort of record about it. I mean, in the earliest years of Christianity, it was a real problem for the Jewish authorities to have this rising movement known as the Way uh, interfering with their religious observances. They wanted to just stamp it out. But if Jesus' friends truly had stolen the body, and what they were saying in Matthew 28 wasn't a rumor but truth, you'd think that they would have been able to produce some sort of proof to show that it was all a hoax. I mean, it's not like Jesus' friends ran off to some faraway country to begin this whole elaborate story. They started talking about Jesus' resurrection days after his public execution in the very same city of Jerusalem that it all went down. But even more than all of these, to me, one of the strongest arguments against the stolen body theory is the historical reality that Jesus' friends had nothing to gain and everything to lose if it was all a lie. It's very well documented that for the first two to three hundred years, Christians were brutally tortured and killed for their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. And how we explain the resolve of Christians in the face of such persecution and, and how we explain the subsequent rise of Christianity to the point of sweeping the entire Roman Empire in just a few centuries and how it has since taken shape throughout history right to this very day where Christians make up 2.6 billion people around our world, a number that's grown at a rate of 1.08%. How we explain all of that I think it's just very unlikely that it was all founded upon the deception of Jesus' friends and followers. So that at least takes us to a second possibility. If Jesus' friends weren't deceivers, maybe they were just deceived. One theory that's been put forward here is known as the swoon theory, which suggests that Jesus' friends were deceived into thinking that he died when in fact he did not. Uh, on the cross, Jesus just fell into a swoon, a deep, unconscious coma-like state. So his friends took him to the tomb and buried him thinking that he was dead, but he in fact was not. So um, after spending time in the cool tomb, he arose, he moved the stone, I don't know, manhandled the, the Roman guards and made it back to his friends who, thinking that he was dead, see him as alive again and assumed the resurrection. And obviously Jesus didn't uh, correct them on that. But there are some problems with this theory as well. For one, if the Romans were good at anything, he was killing. We have clear records of what was involved in crucifixions. We even have um, archaeological evidence of, of crucifixions, nails through feet and so on, the, the stress that it put on the body. 
But for another, assuming that the Romans did just have a bad day and Jesus wasn't really dead, the severity of Jesus' wounds make it highly unlikely that he was able to just get up, roll the stone away, manhandle these guards, and go hang out with his friends all on the third day. I mean, let alone the trauma of the crucifixion. During his trial, Jesus was scourged with a whip that was threaded with bits of bone and metal and glass just opening up his back. So the swoon theory just has its problems. It just doesn't seem feasible. So another theory that people have put forward to explain the idea that perhaps the followers and friends of Jesus were just deceived is known as the hallucination theory. Where the swoon theory suggests that Jesus' friends were deceived into thinking he died when in fact he didn't, the hallucination theory suggests that Jesus' friends were deceived into thinking that he came back to life when in fact he didn't. The basic idea here is that when people go through severe trauma of some kind, they might experience vivid hallucinations or illusions, especially regarding someone that they've loved and lost. So in the case of Jesus' friends, they weren't trying to deceive people. They were just themselves deceived by their profound grief. But the problem here is, well, while grief can and has led people to hallucinate, we have just no compelling evidence for anything like a group hallucination where multiple people see the exact same vision at the exact same time, which is, of course, the claim that has been made here about Jesus' resurrection. And for another, the, the hallucination theory doesn't actually tell us anything about why the tomb of Jesus was empty in the first place. But perhaps more than these combined is the fact that the idea of the resurrection is just not something that would have ever been in the head of a first century Jew to even hallucinate about. I mean, these Jews, they believed in something like a general resurrection at the end of the world when God would raise all of the righteous dead to life. But they had no concept of a single person rising from the dead in the middle of history. You see, you and I, we may have philosophical objections to the resurrection, like dead people don't come back from the dead. These Jews believed that. But in addition to that, they had religiously motivated reasons to actively resist the resurrection. So as hard as it is for, for you and I to accept the resurrection, it was harder still for them, and yet many of them did. Now, of course, there are other theories that we could talk about, the, the wrong tomb theory, the missing body theory, the twin theory, and so on and so forth. But when you go through them all, I think that they all fall short of adequately explaining what are otherwise accepted facts of history, that Jesus died, that his tomb was empty, and that there were subsequent uh, testimonies of his appearing to friends uh, for 40 days, and not to mention the subsequent rise of Christianity as a whole as a result. So in the final analysis, uh, I believe that the best explanation of what we have from history is that Jesus' friends weren't deceivers, they weren't deceived, they were simply devoted to the truth that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Jesus is alive. Now you might say, mm, David, there's still problems with the resurrection theory too. And of course, in principle, I agree, right? You shouldn't take my word for it. You need to investigate this stuff for yourself. Books are written this big that if you drop them, you'll, you'll break a toe, okay? So there's a lot more to say about all of this. But let me just say this much. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the most irritating, hard-hitting, terribly inconvenient, paradigm-shattering claims of history because it forces you to make a choice. Will you accept it or will you reject it? Let me just be candid. You know, I have more questions today than I ever have before. I work for an organization called Questioning Christianity, and yet I have never been more sure of the resurrection of Jesus in my life. Some hugely intelligent people today tell us that everything in this whole entire universe ultimately came from nothing. The idea that life spontaneously arose from non-life uh, through a series of natural processes. And, and some people have tried to, to show the probability of this occurrence, and it's so incredible that you begin to wonder what's more probable, to believe that all life came from non-life, or to believe in something like the resurrection of Jesus, that one non-living man came back alive again. You see, when Christians say that we believe Jesus rose from the dead, it's not that we're adding one more weird thing to our worldview. Resurrection, life from the dead, is the very lens through which we view the world because the fact that any of us are here at all with the head to reason and think and process and consider these things is a kind of life from the dead miracle. And this is something utterly unique to Christianity. I mean, the hidden assumption about life is that death is the end which is why atheism is ultimately hopeless. 
and even for other religions out there, as far as I know, at best they might teach some sort of constellation in the afterlife, if there is indeed an afterlife and we're not just brought back here for another round. But the good news of Jesus teaches resurrection, the undoing of death, the great reversal, the great retrieval of loss and love, where everything sad will come untrue. It is hopeful. And I don't think, again, that that's just wishful thinking, that it's too good to be true. I've tried to give some historical reasons here. But it's precisely the historicity of Jesus' resurrection that guarantees the history of yours and mine. So that we can believe Jesus when he says, because I live, you also will live. And because it's history, you can know it. This claim of Jesus wasn't etched into some secret golden tablets buried in some hill in North America. It wasn't mysteriously revealed in a cave to a man we have no way of getting back to. The death of Jesus and his resurrection was a historical event on public display, which means Christianity is an open book saying, bring it, come and see for yourself if it is true. For all of the transformative impact of Jesus in culture and history, right down to the individual level, it all comes back to this, the historical claim that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Truth invites questioning. And I believe that the resurrection of Jesus provides more answers than it does questions, instilling above and beyond a reasonable hope that death is not the end and bodies sown in the dirt are but seeds that will one day burst forth immortal with new and eternal life.